welcome to day five of our series on the trade union movement and trade unionists and this morning it is fitting that our final lesson is on the politics and the trade union movement it is also fitting that this morning we shall show a post poster, display a poster of Hubert Nathaniel Crichel's monument in front of the parliament buildings. This is what the poster looks like. And this monument is in the compound of the parliament buildings. Okay. Now, it is also important that we mention in this presentation this morning the names of persons who played an important role as well in the trade union movement and, <coughs> and, and politics. And I shall begin with J.P. Lachman Singh. Now, J.P. Lachman Singh was the founder of the Guyana Industrial Workers Union and he, along with Dr. Chetty Jagan, were leaders of the Guyana Industrial Workers Union. Of course, the union was founded by J.P. Lachman Singh and Amos Rangela. But, sorry, but Dr. Chagan came to prominence in that union when he supported J.P. Lachman Singh after the 1948 Enmore riots. And so it's important that in writing labor history, particularly politics and the trade union movement, that we identify J.P. Lachman Singh and uh, Amos Rangela. Of course, it should be mentioned that J.P. Lachman Singh became a politician in his own right. And if you look at the Google slides, you will see that he was a member of the first PPP government in 1953. Okay? Another person who was able to bridge the politics and the trade union movement was Jane Phillips Gay. In our previous lesson, somebody had asked that we remember to mention Jane Phillips Gay. Jane Phillips Gay was the General Secretary on the Guyana Industrial Workers Union. And when the People's Progressive Party had campaigned for seats in the legislature, Jane worked extensively in the sugar estates among the women and she was able to garner insufficient votes for the PPP to win the election in 1953. So here is a picture of Jane Phillips Gay. Now, one does not talk about politics and the trade union movement without mentioning Dr. Shelley Jagan. Okay, and Dr. Chetty Jagan in 1947 won a seat in the legislature as an independent uh, candidate. He also was a part of the Manpower Citizens Association, the first Indian led trade union. He subsequently resigned his position as treasurer and he became involved in the Guyana Industrial Workers Union. He had also established his own union and he was the president of the Sawmill Workers Union. Throughout his years as a politician, he was able to bridge the gap between politics and trade unionism and one would see that he was extremely and highly respected in the Guyana Agriculture and Workers Union. One of the things that I have to check on and you can as well do research on 
is to find out if Jagan was later named uh, the President General of the Guyana Agricultural and Workers Union. Now let's look at another politician who benefited from his relationship Good morning, thank you for joining. Who benefited from his relationship in the trade union movement. And here we mention Lyndon Forbes, Samson Burnham. At the time of the death of Richlow, Burnham was president of the British Guyana Labour Union in 1958. When the PPP won the elections in 1953, Burnham was one of the cabinet ministers. In fact, he was appointed Minister of Education. Burnham remained very, very close to the Guyana Lady Union and uh, on his death, his supporters were able to change the constitution so that uh, he became President General of the Trade Union. His successor, U. Desmond Hoyt, succeeded him in 1985 as President General of the Guyana Labor Union. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, this woman, one does not write about the role of women in the trade union movement without mentioning Eileen Cox. Right, so whenever you research on women in the trade union movement, please remember to mention to begin your discussion with Eileen Cox. The Women's Auxiliary of the Guyana Public Service Union was established in 1963, and she was able to keep those files. I am pretty sure that there is a collection in the University of Guyana Library. I also want to mention Mr. Stanley Troyer. I don't know, yes. Stanley Troyer was a president of the Guyana Labor Union and uh, he was important to the observance and respect for the history of the Guyana Labor Union. So I think we, we, we have a fair idea of uh, politics and labor and its effects on uh, the people of Guyana. As usual, we shall begin our discussion by starting with Critchlow. And here we're talking about Hubert Nathaniel Critchlow, the politician. In 1941, when Hubert Nathaniel Critchlow appeared before the Franchise Commission, he reiterated the point that trade unions should become involved in politics. He stated that it was not unusual for the British Guyana Labour Union to support candidates at municipal elections in Georgetown and on the East Bank Demerara. He was a member of the Georgetown Town Council. He stressed that the union could nominate political candidates since one of the functions of the union was to train men to think politically. He had been a member of the Popular Party in 1926. In 1927, he dealt with the question of extending the franchise to women. Critchlow stated that some of his female members were not eligible to vote because they were mainly employed in low-paying jobs. In 1928, the British government imposed on Guyana what was known as the Crown Colony Constitution. Guyana's history was different from that of the Caribbean in that we were once colonized by the Dutch. Hence, when the Dutch had seceded to the uh, British, it was included as part of the agreement that that the government that no government would ever get rid of the Romano Dutch law or the constitution. However, by 1928, there were so many uh, descendants of slaves and immigrants who had begun to 
enter the legislature that it was thought necessary by the colonial government that there should be a change in the constitution. In one of the previous lectures, I had mentioned that African and Portuguese women had been actively involved in politics and it is because of their involvement and support for their male candidates that one saw a change in the legislature from merely plant descendants of the plantocracy to descendants of African slaves and immigrants. Now, in 1928, when the Crown Colony Constitution was imposed on Guyana, Critchlow opposed it because he claimed that the poor and African Guyanese would suffer. As I mentioned, this was totally unconstitutional. What is important here for us to note is that Critchlow had always fought for West Indian Federation or the unity of the Caribbean as well as Guyana. In England, in 1926, he had supported the call for West Indian Federation. He expressed his support again in 1938 at a conference which was held in Trinidad and Guyana in June 1944. On the 5th of September 1945, Critchlow presented a resolution to the Legislative Council for West Indian Federation. In September 1947, Critchlow was the only Guyanese labor leader who accepted the proposal for a closer union of the Federation of the British colonies in the Caribbean area. He did not have the support of Theophilus Lee of the Cosmopolitan Union and Ayub Eden of the Manpower Citizens Association. Let us look at Caribbean unity. Uh, sorry. The MPCA and constitutional reform. In 1939, the MPCA called for constitutional reform, adult suffrage, an elected majority in the legislature, payment for representatives in the legislature, security of tenure for estate workers, legislation to permit peaceful picketing, and the extension of workmen's compensation to agricultural workers. In 1947, a committee comprising Hubert Nathaniel Critchlow, Alfred Athiel Thorne, Ashton Chase, Dr. Claude Denbow, Robert Hart, John Carter, Osmond Lucas, Eden Shakur, David Harper, the Union Heads of the Benefit Society, Brooms, and other trade union leaders demanded adult suffrage. Sir Creech Jones, the Secretary of State, refused the request but asked for a figure that would represent a minimum wage. The figure was accepted and the franchise was reduced from $40 to $10 per month. Literacy in one's language was also accepted as a requirement. The British Guyana Labour Party and the 1947 elections. In 1947, the following unions combined to form the British Guyana Labour Party. The British Guyana Labour Union, the Cosmopolitan Workers Union, the British Guyana Workers League, the Guyana League of Colored Peoples, the British Guyana East Indian Association, and other working class organizations. The party won six of the 14 seats. Let's look at Jocelyn Hubbard and the British Guyana Clerks Association. And once again, I must mention that there is a Jocelyn Hubbard collection in the University of Galana Library in the Caribbean Reference Department section. On August 1, 1939, the British Guyana Clerks Association was registered. The most vibrant member was Jocelyn Hubbard. The union failed because of the clerk's fear of victimization. In 1957, the union changed its name to the Clerical and Commercial Workers Union. In 1947, sorry, in 1946, Shady Jagan, 
Janet Jagan, Justin Hubbard, and Ashton Chase, the latter two of whom were active trade unionists, formed the Political Affairs Committee in, uh, in 1947. Shady Jagan won the election as a as a independent member of the council of the legislative council. Uh, it is important that I mention that Justin Hubbard became very important in the People's Progressive Party, and as I said before, there is a collection in the University of Guyana Library. Let's look at the trade unions of the Sugar Belt. By 1946, the unions which were established in the Sugar Belt were the British Guyana Workers League, the Manpower Citizens Association, the Demerara Overseas Association, the British Guyana and West Indian Sugar Boilers Union, British Guyana Drivers Association, and the Sugar Estates Clerks Association, which was later called the National Association of Agricultural, Commercial, and Industrial Employees. Dr. Nanda Kashore has a publication on this uh, union and uh, I am pretty sure that he might still have copies available for sale. Now, the 1953 elections, all 10 constituencies where the sugar estates were established voted for the working class party, the PPP. The PPP won the 1953 elections. The ministers of the new government included Dr. Chedi Jagan, president of the Sawmill and Workers, Forest Workers Union, Dr. J.P. Latchman Singh, president of the Guyana Industrial Workers Union, Elephus Burnham, president of the British Guyana Labor Union, and Ashton Chase, assistant secretary of the British Guyana Union. May I mention here that when the People's Progressive Party had split, that there were members from the former uh, People's Progressive Party, trade unionists, who had joined with the, the uh, PNC, People's National Congress. In those days, it was called, initially it was called People's Progressive Party as well, but then for electoral reasons, it was changed to People's National Congress. And joining with Forbes Burnham were Jane Phillips Gay. It is said that it was she who suggested that they have their own party. Uh, and so there was Jane Phillips Gay as well as Dr. J.P. Latchman Singh. They joined with Forbes Burnham and they established their own party. What is interesting, if you can research on Jane Phillips Gay in the formation of the People's Progressive uh, Party, as it was called then, People's Progressive Party, Burnhamite, and subsequently the name changed to People's National Congress. Let's look at internal self-government. When British Guyana achieved internal self-government in 1961, the colony was granted observer status as an international labor organization. The first three members team in 1964 were three member team was Ranji Chandi Singh with Ashton Chase as his advisor, Colonel G. B. Thompson, employers, and Richard Ishmael represented <coughs> the Labor Department. Ashton Chase is the author of the history of the trade union movement in Guyana, and I'm pretty sure that you can also get copies of his book either from him because he's still alive or he will direct you to the bookstore in which his books are sold. Let's look at strikes which have a political tone. In 1962 the trade unions objected to the Caldor budget. During 1963 there was another crisis in the trade union movement when the Labor Relations Bill was presented in Parliament. It was opposed by the United Force. The United Force is a party which was established by the Portuguese businessman Peter Bigar, right? Uh, the People's National Congress, the Trade Union Council, 
some U.S. labor organizations and other interest groups in the society. Hence, there was the what has come to be known as the Eight Day Strike. Sixty thousand workers were involved in the strike. Now, the strike. Uh, one of the consequences of the strike was there was a split in the trade union movement because there were trade unions who supported the ruling party at the time, the People's Progressive Party, and then there were trade unions who had aligned themselves with the opposition. One of the things you're going to see from this period is very often there are splits in the trade union council, right? And uh, so we do not, for instance, Mr. Daniels, George Daniels, when there was disagreement with the government, he had split with the trade union council then, the trade union council. Later on, Mr. Carville Duncan established the Federation of Independent Trade Unions in Guyana. And so he is the president of that organization. The vice president was once Kumal Shan. Now let's look back and let's look now at representation at the discussions for the independence constitution. In 1965, history was created in the labor movement where the TUC was represented at the discussions for the independent state for British Guyana by David Passad, president of TUC, Basil Blair, PAS, Richard Ishmael, advisor to the TUC, and Winslow Carrington president of the Transport Workers Union. Labor movement was also active in the creation of the Republic in 1970. By 1976, nationalization had led to a change of employers. There was a shift from foreign representatives of multinational corporations to state ownership and the government as employers of the, uh, of the various offices and, and, and entities. This transformation made the trade unions revisit their status and role in a modern Guyana. In other words, according to the late uh, Samuel Walker, who was president of the Guyana Labor Union, there seemed to be a conflict between the trade unions and the government. The, in the past, the politicians were aligned with the trade unions and had supported them but now with a change of face and race and color one found that the trade unions had to adjust to the fact that the people who they once represented were people who had now become employers and so it was a painful transition that had occurred from pre-1970 to post-1970. It will be interesting for you to find out if this is the reason why uh, there has been a reduction in the number of trade unions in Guyana. In the 1960s, there were about 60 trade unions. 19, uh, in the 1970s, there were around 24 and in the 21st century we now have 14 trade unions that exist clearly the trade unions have recognized especially the Guyana labor union and the Guyana cultural and general workers union that there is a nexus between the politicians and themselves now, when the Guyana Labor Union had devised their constitution, President Hugh Desmond Hoy, was made, the leader of the PNC, was appointed general, President General of the Union. On his death, the new leader of the PNC, Robert Kerbin, succeeded Hoy as President General. And I, I think it was a similar thing that had happened with the uh, Ghana Agriculture and General Workers Union, okay? So that that 
is something that we need to examine. We have come to the end of our series on the trade unionism and trade unionists. I have been your presenter for the last five days. My name is Hazel Wolford. I am the Registrar of the Guyana Institute of Historical Research. As I have been saying throughout these presentations, that if there are any questions that you have, that you are free to <coughs> message me on the Facebook page. I do hope for those of you who have comments, recommendations, queries, that I have been faithful in responding to them. Now, the Guyana Institute of Historical Research runs a Montrose Academy. It's a one-week kids' history school, and in the light of the pandemic, we were forced to go virtual in 2020 as well as this year. We have no idea what's going to happen in 2022. The Institute of Historical Research also runs history programs for adults and registration will begin very shortly. Director of Public Education is Dr. David Hines. The di sorry, the Director of Higher Education is Dr. David Hines. The Director of Public Education for the ch is Mrs. Claudette Hunt. The lecturer on the African Dynasty History Program is Dr. Il Dr. Professor or Professor Dr. Elizabeth Anstey. So you will hear more from us when we begin to promote the program. But I know that people have already begun applying, begun applying for the program, which begins in September. Thank you for participating in this series, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you in the future. Have a great day. Bye.